So, um, Madam Attorney General, before we start with your application, um, I think you're aware that there is an application to intervene in this case. Yeah, um, before we give um, thought to our determination of that application upon the papers, we made clear that we would seek the representations of um, the parties to this application. Um, I have seen since arriving in court that the respondent has made representations. Do you have any to make? Um, my lady, we've seen um, both representations and our position is one of neutrality on the issue. Thank you very much indeed. Mr Green, um, thank you very much for your note. Um, fortunately, it is um, focused and short, which means that I certainly have been able to read it, and I hope my Lord and my Lady have too. Um, I don't know that it's necessary for you to make any further representations. Uh, my Lady, uh, rehearsing what I've already written down would be unhelpful. Well, thank, you. thank you very much. Her Majesty's Attorney General is to seek leave to refer a sentence which she regards as unduly lenient pursuant to Section 36 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988. There is an application to intervene in that application by the Centre for Women's Justice and a campaign organisation, We Can't Consent to This. This application was received yesterday. It was served upon the respondent, it seems, by email timed at 9.40. We are grateful to Mr Green for his consideration of the application and his representations in respect of it, and also to Madam Attorney General for the indication that the position of the law officer is one of neutrality. The application makes this claim that the organisations are uniquely placed to intervene in terms of their expertise and do so in order to assist the court in this matter which raises issues of significant public interest. In particular, the compilation of a body of research on the impact of and risks from strangulation, which details both the risk of psychological and physical harm as a consequence, and secondly, that research referring to the prevalence of an understanding of the strangulation within the context of domestic abuse. The application concludes by making submissions which seek to influence the sentence in this case. In our view, the application is both unorthodox and misconceived in that it seeks to make representations in the matter of sentence and not on an issue of law or otherwise of evidence in relation to conviction. Section 36 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988 permits the Attorney General with leave of the court to refer what appears to her as an unduly lenient sentence for review. That permission is rightly strongly guarded. There are safeguards behind the legislation which requires the Attorney General or Solicitor General themselves to consider whether in their discretion they should refer the matter of sentence. This is so in order to preserve the interference of the judiciary in the matters of sentencing in criminal offences being kept to those where review is necessarily to be considered. Careful consideration will be given, therefore, to the individual circumstances of a case. 
Section 36 does not provide the prosecution with the general right of appeal against sentence, and the law officers abide by this compunction religiously. The Court of Appeal will consider a reference on the facts proved or admitted in the court below. They are not a court of first instance. It is not the function of the court to substitute in the light of new material which had not been before the sentencer its own view as to what the sentence should be. See, in this respect, the case of Bowden, 2006, EWCA, Crim, 2000, forgive me, Crim, 785. More recently, it is clear from the Attorney General's reference number 79 of 2015, <coughs> see 2016, EWCA, Crim, 448, that the power of this court to declare a sentence unduly lenient depends entirely on what was put before the original sentencing court. It is not open to the Attorney General to rely upon the further evidence not placed before the sentencing court to justify the reference. If this court did decide that the sentence passed by the sentencer was unduly lenient, then it will be at liberty to look at fresh material, but will only do so insofar as that material is relevant to the facts or circumstances of the case. In this application, Mr Green, on behalf of the respondent, makes the following submissions. The studies which have been referenced in the application to intervene largely, to seem, largely seem to feature cases of non-consensual strangulation, whereas this is a case where the choking was consensual and resulted in injuries at the minor end of strangulation injuries. The generic assertions and selective studies referenced in the application to intervene do not, it is submitted, enlighten the court as to whether the recorder of Middlesbrough took the right course on the facts of this case. Moreover, the proposed intervener's submissions appear to proceed on the premise that the deceased did not in any meaningful sense consent to being choked for sexual gratification. None of this is on all fours with this case or of assistance. We regard those comments to be well made. This application is refused. Madam Attorney General. I'm grateful, I'm grateful to May it please, I appear with my learned friend, Mr. Glasgow, Queen's Counsel, and Mr. Green, Queen's Counsel, appears on behalf of the offender. Lady, this is an application for leave to refer the sentence imposed on this offender, Samuel Pybus, as unduly lenient. The offender is 32 years of age, having been born on the 23rd of July, 1989. On the 9th of July of this year, he pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of Sophie Moss. On the 7th of September, His Honour Judge Watson QC, the Recorder of Middlesbrough, sentenced the offender to four years and eight months imprisonment. In order that the court can better understand the basis for the reference, it is proposed to identify the submissions that are made in support of this application at the outset. And it's submitted, in short, that the judge fell into error when he concluded, firstly, that the offender's actions did not create a high risk of serious harm, of which he should have been aware. And secondly, the offence could not be properly characterised as one of medium culpability. Lady, Sophie could not and did not consent to being strangled beyond the point of unconsciousness. Once unconscious, she was particularly vulnerable, since she could do nothing to alert the offender to the danger she was now in, or to indicate that she wanted him to stop. And the continued application of pressure to her neck, which was of sufficient force to prevent her from breathing, was an obviously dangerous act, and one which carried with it a high risk of harm, since it further starved her already injured brain of oxygen. May I ask you this, Madam Attorney yes. General? 
do, do you accept the correctness of the judge's analysis on the interrelation between obviousness and level of risk? If one looks at the sentencing um, hearing, page five, where the judge commented um, when debating the issues with Mr. Wright for the prosecution, the judge said this at page 5C, the Crown would accept that an obvious risk is not necessarily the same as a high risk. Do you yes, accept that? Yes, we you do. accept that. Thank you. Thank you, my lady. So these submissions are predicated upon the following simple analysis of the facts. Firstly, Sophie was a woman who suffered from poor physical and mental health, and therefore she was vulnerable. Secondly, on the night of her death, the offender had consumed a significant quantity of alcohol before he went to see Sophie. Once he was in her company, the two of them drank more alcohol together. Third, the offender told the police that he had no memory of what had happened and that he could only recall being sat in his front room at home and then coming to in Sophie's bedroom, at which time she was naked and not breathing and his hands were hurting. The offender said that he assumed he had strangled her, but, the, but he, that he did not know what had happened. Fourth, the offender said that he and Sophie had had a casual sexual relationship for several years. He said that he had visited her about six times each year for the purposes of sex. He said that he used to dominate her and that she liked to be choked during sexual intercourse. Fifth, Sophie's partner told the police that they had engaged in this sort of activity together. But crucially, my lady, what of course she could not and did not consent to was the infliction of serious harm or fatal injury. Any consent that she gave was limited to the restriction of her breathing up to but not beyond the point of unconsciousness, since the purpose of the act was to heighten her sexual pleasure and not to render her incapable of participation in the act itself. Indeed, once unconscious, she was no longer capable of consenting to anything at all. Uh, and I refer you to the first uh, sentence, paragraph B, um, of the judge's remarks, where he makes it clear that um, significant prolonged compression to her neck, it was to cause unconsciousness and subsequently her untimely and tragic death. Do we know, though, um, and if so, can you point me to the evidence before the court, that the pressure continued after she became unconscious? I don't know, otherwise she wouldn't have, she wouldn't have died. Well, my submission, my lady, is that she would have reached a point of unconsciousness because she died something. Of, of course, but the, the point that you're making um, is that the continuation of the strangulation after she had become obviously unconscious was the high risk indicator. So I'm just wondering where that is in the evidence. Do you see it in the pathology report? In this way, um, of course, we've identified the mechanism of death is one of, is one of strangulation. It's the compression on the neck that leads to death, and she died of asphyxiation. If one considers it in this way, had she slipped into unconsciousness, and at that stage the offender released the pressure from her neck, she would have been able to breathe, and death would not have resulted. Well, where do you find the evidence for that, Mr. Basco, rather than assert it? It's rather speculative, I'm afraid. We have to deal with the facts of the case. When one looks first at the cause of death, which is asphyxiation, yes. and one identifies that there was no blockage to her throat, so nothing to prevent her from breathing, other than the fact that there was compression to her neck. The compression has to have gone beyond the point of unconsciousness and further. Where do you what find that on the evidence, Mr. Glasgow? With respect, it, it, it is, we would suggest, a simple analysis of the way in which... But it's not necessarily the mechanism that's identified. The mechanism identified is one of asphyxiation through neck compression. Yes, but what you go on to do is to assume a period of unconsciousness, whereas the pathological evidence is quite clear, is it not, that so far as the conclusions to be drawn 
and the injuries are concerned. The pressure to the neck would have been at least in tens of seconds, yes. but possibly minutes, but not significant, and it was impos impossible to accurately quantify the force or duration. Quite so. We don't suggest for a moment it's possible to identify either the level of force or the duration of the compression, but what one needs to consider, as the judge did in his opening remarks, is that the steps to death began first with unconsciousness and then subsequently death. Now, it may well have been that that is in a relatively short compass, but undoubtedly one precedes the other. Yes, but your case, or the Attorney General's case, is that the compression continued after unconsciousness. As it had to have done, but many with respect, because had the pressure been released, she would therefore have been able to breathe. Well, where's been... the evidence as to that? It may have got to a stage where, for whatever reason, the ability of her body to cope with the lack of oxygen that had so far been occasioned had led to this situation, unfortunately, that meant that she could not recover. There's no indication of the damage to the brain which would suggest, as a result of the compression, she'd been rendered incapable of breathing. And one, one considers the, the way in which the death is described by the pathologist, it, it's death as a result of asphyxiation. There's no suggestion that, in some respect, there's been brain trauma or axonal damage which has led to an inability of her body to breathe. So you say that, on the, the evidence, there had to be something between consciousness and death? Yes. What we don't seek to suggest at any point is that one can identify any degree of time that there is between the first and the, and the second. One follows the other, whether it follows swiftly or not, one doesn't know. But the significance that we attach and the relevance we suggest to unconsciousness in a case like this it is as follows, and I know that Madam Attorney will deal with this in a moment, but the offender is in the course of having sexual intercourse with Sophie Moss. And during the course of that intercourse, she has requested that he restrict her breathing. As a result of that restriction, as the recorder of Middlesbrough identified, she slipped into unconsciousness. At that stage, she is thereafter incapable of saying or doing anything. Whether that's only for a matter of a second or two for a little longer, does not, we suggest, matter at all. The significance is that at that stage, she is particularly vulnerable. The pressure continues, and thereafter she dies. And that, we respectfully submit, is the important feature of the pathology, pathological evidence, which perhaps wasn't dealt with in the same detail as the lower court as we're trying to deal with it here. We appreciate, of course, that the pathologist cannot put a time on the duration of the compression. It's indeed very rare that any pathologist can do any such circumstance. But what you do know is that be it tens of seconds or longer, there is a period of time beyond the point of unconsciousness which the offender continued to compress Sophie Moss's neck, during which her breathing was restricted, which led to the asphyxiation from which she died. I don't know whether this is appropriate for you or for Madam Attorney General, but I'm you mentioned what is, was explored below. It's clear from what was explored below that the prosecution position was B, but not uh, at all costs, as it were. Quite it was so. B or alternatively C. Yes, and in the course of exchange with the recorder of Mr. Early from Mr. Wright Queen's Council, who dealt with it at the lower court, began by advancing B as a, a, a culpability level that the court should and could consider, but following exchanges with the learned judge, um, he didn't resist the judge's conclusion that C might be a more appropriate category in which this case should fall. Thank you very much. Thank you. The other thing, Mr. Glasgow, is that, um, as you quite rightly concede, that um, there's now an attempt to look into the um, the mechanism of death more um, specifically than was done in the court below. Um, you heard me say, in terms of the application to intervene, that this court deals with the facts as were presented in the court below. Yes. And looking at the opening um, of the prosecution, uh, there was nothing to suggest, as is suggested now in the written reference, that um, this was something that 
created an obviously high risk of GBH or death? Well, it, it was certainly advanced at the lower court that an, an obviously high risk could be found, but Mr Wright conceded that he wouldn't press that point. And certainly the analysis that we have embarked on in discussion with the court this morning was not dealt with below. But what we're not seeking to do is to advance a different evidential position before this court, because I well appreciate the observations my lady made in the earlier judgment, and also the restrictions that there are on this court considering evidence that wasn't presented at the lower court. But what we are doing is identifying with respect findings that the sentencing judge himself made, having heard the evidence, and he has identified, uh, as Madam Attorney referred to a little earlier, at his opening observations, that the compression of the neck led first to unconsciousness, uh, and subsequently her untimely and tragic death. And it's that aspect of his factual findings following the presentation of the evidence that we are paying particular attention to, and we invite this court to focus upon. Can I ask one question? A minute, but you do not suggest that there is anything in the evidence that gives rise to other than what the judge indicated, that the time after which um, for uh, Miss Moss fell into unconsciousness can be in any way determined on the evidence? No, I certainly don't. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. My fault, Mr Glasgow, but you, you mentioned there was no indication of damage to the deceased's brain to show she could not breathe. And I just can't... I'm looking at Dr Cooper's full report, and it's no doubt my fault, but I just can't find uh, the report on the um, condition of, of the brain. No, there is a complete absence of any reference to investigation of axonal damage, so there is, there is an absence of any evidence before the lower court to suggest that there was, as has been discussed with... Lady, Lady Justice McCurr, there's an absence of any evidence to suggest that there was an inability of her body to breathe because she'd sustained some form of brain injury as a result of the neck compression prior to death. I, I wasn't seeking to suggest, I'm sorry, it must have been the inelegant way in which I expressed myself, no, no, which no, I apologise. No, I don't seek to suggest that there was an examination of her brain which identified a complete absence of axonal damage or ischemia. What we're simply identifying is that on the evidence presented at the lower court, that's not a conclusion that one could reach. Thank you. I hope that assists, and I'm, I'm sorry to have interrupted. Um, to, to sum up in, in, the, the exchange there, in order, my lady, for Sophie to have died at the hands of the offender, it was necessary therefore for him to strangle her to the point of unconsciousness and beyond, as we've just explored, to compress her neck for long enough that injury was caused, and to leave her in a state in which she was unable to do or say anything to prevent further harm from coming to her. The risk of serious harm might not be a high one while she was conscious, and able therefore to indicate any withdrawal of her consent, but once she was unconscious, the risk of serious harm became um, the risk of serious harm became a high risk. Indeed, uh, my seventh point, the risk of serious injury became increasingly greater with every second that the manual strangulation continued after Sophie had lost consciousness. So are you really just fo focusing on the period post-unconsciousness? Post, uh, yes, it's, it's my submission that that's when the harm... Uh, when the risk was high. Yes, and obviously... And certainly for my part, you'll need to address... The question of, in the, if that is, as it were, the re nuanced position, uh, how that ought to have been obvious in all the circumstances to uh, the respondent. Because he would have been, she would have been limp in his arms. Well, for the purposes of the guideline. I, I, I submit that she would have been, in the circumstances, limp uh, in, in his arms um, if she was unconscious. Um, it would have been obvious. It, it is obvious to any reasonable person when another person is un falling into unconsciousness or has fallen into that state. Um, and, and as I referred, the, the, the judge uh, agreed that unconsciousness was followed uh, by, um, by, by death. E even if we could only be talking about seconds. <laughs> 
it may well have been seconds, it may have been minutes, it was still um, strong enough to kill her. She would no longer have been an active participant um, in the sexual act that the offender claims she was enjoying. So with that, um, the judge was correct to conclude that any compression to the neck creates an obvious risk of brain damage or worse. However, as my learned friend Mr. Glasgow has just said, he fell into error when assessing that the risk of such harm was not so high as to justify putting this case into category B. And therefore, despite the absence of precision as to the duration of the compression, the stark reality of this case is that it was long enough to render Sophie unconscious and then to kill her. Whether it was tens of seconds or longer matters not, I respectfully submit. What matters is that once she had been rendered unconscious, thus in effect lifeless, uh, and in my submission obviously lifeless, the offender continued to strangle her. The perilous position in which Sophie now found herself should have been all too apparent to the offender given at the time of the compression he claims to have been engaged in sexual activity with her. May I just ask for this point of clarification, Madam Attorney General? Um, it seems that when emergency services arrived at the scene, they were sufficiently satisfied of some signs of life to attempt a prolonged resuscitation. So, on that basis, how do we feed that into the submissions you now make? That she would have been lifeless, and obviously so. Well, she would have appeared lifeless to a, a reasonable person. She may well have had um, a minimally eating heart, um, or she may well have had some signs, but we do know that it did causally lead to her death eventually. I don't think that quite meets the point. One of the submissions you make is that it would have been obvious to any reasonable person in this offender's position that he had whatever period of time um, available to him to come to his senses, passed a certain line and his partner had fallen into unconsciousness and become lifeless. And you then went on to say that um, the timing doesn't matter. It, it led to death. Um, How, how do you distinguish the, the nature of the other evidence before the court? Well, the medical evidence sets out, I would submit, quite a broad range from a minimum of 10 seconds to several minutes. No one knows what happened, but it's possible. Is there anything in the pathology report that gives the opinion um, as to how the deceased would have appeared. No, other than right. if she was unconscious, she wouldn't have been moving or speaking. Yes. And of course, there's no indication of the extent to which these particular sexual practices had been taken in the past. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Although I would just note that he had said in interview that he hadn't caused her any harm before. In yes, well, that's dependent upon his subjective opinion as to harm, isn't it? Thank you, Ms. Um, yes, so, so it's submitted, therefore, in summary, um, that to continue to strangle someone who is unconscious carries an obviously high risk of death or serious harm. Harm has already occurred as a result of the loss of consciousness 
and continued pressure upon the neck can only end in one result unless the pressure is released before death. I don't propose to go through the facts unless you would like me to. Maybe. No, thank you. Not from the third. Right. No, thank you, Madam Attorney okay. General. So I, I will just then briefly touch on the aggravating and mitigating features before my conclusions. Um, when it comes then to the sentencing exercise, there are several aggravating features that are relevant to any assessment of the gravity of the offender's conduct. Firstly, the deceased was vulnerable. She was vulnerable by reason of her personal circumstances and also because she was unconscious. Secondly, the offender was in a position of trust owing to the nature of his relationship with the deceased. He was in an intimate relationship with Sophie and trusted by her not to hurt her despite the inherently dangerous act they were engaged in. Thirdly, the offender was intoxicated. He had consumed a considerable amount of alcohol before going to see the deceased and he continued to drink whilst he was with her. And lastly, the offender failed to offer any assistance to the deceased. He did not attempt to give any first aid. He did not ring for help. He simply waited outside of her house on his own account for about 15 minutes and then drove himself to the police station. There are also mitigating features that require consideration. Firstly, the offence was not premeditated. Secondly, the offender was of good character. And thirdly, the offender expressed remorse for what he had done. And lastly, the offender pleaded guilty. And just for point of clarification, I note in the submissions of Mr Green that he uh, raises issue with the guilty plea credit. We don't uh, take issue with that, issue, with that, with that, uh, with that matter. So in terms of the relevant sentencing provisions and authorities, maybe we'll be aware, the maximum penalty for manslaughter is life imprisonment, and it's a serious specified offence for the purpose of Section 224 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003. And when sentencing offences of manslaughter, the court must treat the consequences as unintentional and unintended. However, Section 1431 of the Act provides in considering the seriousness of any offence, the court must consider the offender's culpability in committing the offence and any harm which the offence caused, was intended to cause or might foreseeably have caused. And the Sentencing Council's definitive guideline on manslaughter applies, which requires any sentencing judge to go through the following steps in order to identify the appropriate sentence. And these are the following steps which are relevant to this offender. Step one determining the offence category. And the following sections of the guideline merit consideration. Category B, high culpability, that death was caused in the course of an unlawful act which carried a high risk of death, or GBH, which was or ought to have been obvious. Step two, starting point and the category range. My submission is that pursuant to category B, the guideline provides a sentencing range of between 8 and 16 years and a starting point of 12 years. Step 4 is the next relevant step. There's a, there's a huge jump, isn't there, between the sentencing levels between category? Yes, correct. And that's why I submit it is unduly lenient um, and not just lenient. Step 4, the offender pleaded guilty. Step 6, we, the judge needs to consider whether the total sentence is just and proportionate to the overall offending behaviour. The next relevant step is step eight, the judge gives reasons, and then step nine, the time spent on remand is to be taken into account. It's my submission, lady, that the Sentencing Council's overarching principles and domestic abuse apply. The guideline identifies the principles relevant to the sentencing of cases involving domestic abuse. The domestic context of the offending behaviour makes it more serious because it represents a violation of the trust and security that exists between people in an intimate relationship. The Sentencing Council's definitive guideline on reduction in sentence for a guilty plea applies, stipulating a sliding scale of credit to be given to an offender depending on the stage at which any guilty plea is entered. The full discount of one third should only be given where the plea is entered at the first stage of the proceedings. And you take no issue with that point? No. no. 
May I go back to the domestic violence overarching guideline, please? Um, that which you um, quote uh, is, of course, taken directly from the overarching principles relating to domestic abuse. But the scope of the guideline um, has not been referred to in either the written reference nor was it referred to before the court below, um, and you don't deal with it orally before us. So I wonder if we could look at that together, particularly bearing in mind the point that the respondent takes about this, yes. because it does need to be addressed, I think. So the scope of the guideline um, makes clear that there's no specific offence of domestic abuse it's a general term describing a range of violent and or controlling or coercive behaviour. And it goes on to indicate a useful but not statutory definition of domestic abuse presently used by the government is uh, as follows. Any incident or pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive, threatening behaviour, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over who are or have been intimate partners or family members regardless of gender or sexu sexuality. So looking at the facts of this case, um, the reference quite clearly shows that the relationship between this offender and the deceased was spasmodic, was consensual, and uh, certainly would struggle to come close to an intimate relationship other than the sexual relations themselves. So how is this brought into play, particularly bearing in mind or Justice Bean's recent judgment? Yes, I'm grateful, my lady. I submit that the guidelines can apply. It's very clear on the face of the guidelines that it can be a single incident as well, which qualifies for the guidelines. Um, and yes, I um, note the uh, Lord Justice Bean's analysis in the Williams case, but I would respectfully submit that that is limited to the facts. There was a, um, and, and wouldn't be uh, applicable in this instance for several reasons. First of all, here we do have um, a, a position where the victim is vulnerable. We also have uh, an offender who is dominant, and we also have an intimate relationship. I, I um, accept what you say, that there's not a, an established you know, loving relationship or marriage or substantial relationship, but it is nonetheless intimate. Um, and that is the term used in the guidelines. And therefore, there was a breach of trust. This wasn't the first time that they had been engaged in this activity. It had spanned some years, and they, there was a built-up level of trust whereby the victim um, would have had confidence that she would not have been hurt uh, to the level of unconsciousness and indeed death by the offender. It's really the and sentence, I, forgive me, it's the sentence in Lord Justice Bean's judgment. We do not consider, I haven't got paragraph numbers, I'm afraid, we do not consider that on its proper construction, the guideline on domestic abuse is authority for the proposition that in every case, an act of violence committed out of the blue by an offender against his spouse or partner is to be sentenced more severely so simply because it is an offence of violence within the home. Certainly there is in our judgment no such principle applicable to a case of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. Yes, it all depends on the facts of the case. Yes, and I would respectfully submit that it does all depend on the facts of this case. There, there aren't uh, particular principles of doctrine that would apply um, across the board um, and to cases with very, very different factual matrices um, such as this one. You say to my lady's point about the fact none of this was referred to below. Um, it doesn't appear to have occurred to anybody that the domestic abuse guideline was in play. 
Yes, and I can only apologise, um, but it is... It, it, you, you weren't there, so... Yes, <laughs> well, on behalf of the Crown, uh, generally. Um, I, 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 I've read the transcript, and, and you're right, it wasn't pursued or referred to by Prosecution Council. Were um, inquiries made, Madam Attorney-General? Uh, were inquiries made when someone takes over uh, the conduct of the case in the Court of Appeal, it's usual to make McCook inquiries. And in those circumstances, the respondent's notice making clear that it, it, it was perhaps um, a case of Mr. Wright, Queen's Counsel, forming the view that it did not apply rather than not thinking of it. I just wonder if inquiries were made. It's not a matter of apology, it's a matter of justifying why the Attorney General takes a different stance to potential and implicit concessions made in the court below. But we, we haven't got any conclusive view as to why... Well, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not quite good enough. If inquiries were made of Mr Wright as, why, as to why he did not consider that the overarching guideline applied, what was his response? Lady, I, I, don't believe, I don't believe that Mr Wright and I exchanged particular emails about that, that individual point, although we did discuss the reference itself in general terms. The, the reason why we have identified the uh, application of the guideline, uh, and with respect, wh whether it was a conscious decision by Mr Wright or not, uh, we're not seeking to place any criticism at his door at all. We have had an opportunity to reflect on whether the guideline might apply given it wasn't referred to at the lower court, as my lady rightly observed earlier on, that wouldn't be a route by which to suggest that this is an unduly lenient sentence. It's a matter for this court to consider if it gives leave to the uh, Majesty's Attorney General's application. So if the court considers the sentence is unduly lenient, then the question of whether this, gui this guideline applies is one which should be considered by the court. Uh, and it may well be that... Um, given the way that the aggravating features were dealt with in the lower court, namely the breach of trust and the reference to the nature of their relationship, that it was felt unnecessary to add in a reference to the domestic abuse guideline, because in effect, the aggravating features that apply from that guideline have already been taken into account when one considers the nature of the relationship and the way in which Ms Moss met her death. We've attempted to add more focused to the guideline itself, <coughs> simply to identify the significance, as we put it, about the nature of their relationship, which we suggest was an intimate relationship, albeit a sporadic one. But to, to be very clear about this, you're saying that that will only come into play if we determine that on the basis of the material before the court below, the sentence passed was unduly lenient. Yes, and insofar as this guideline is concerned, as I've said, I don't... With respect, I don't think there's any material that was left out before the lower court. It simply didn't have the focus on this guideline. Well, can we look at what was said in the, the lower course. court about the abuse of trust and where this appears in the prosecution aid? So, on page 5 at F, Mr Wright starts to um, make the submissions regarding the aggravating factors. Yes. First of all, the vulnerability, and, and Madam Attorney General has referred to that already. Secondly, the voluntary intoxication. And then finally, the failure to seek emergency medical assistance. Yes. So, um, 
what is it in that that indicates a, um, a, a breach of trust? In the way it's expressed there, it certainly doesn't appear that there's been a clear reference to the breach of trust. Well, there's, there's no reference to any position of trust, let alone a breach of it. And this is what appears in paragraph 8b, the reference. Yes. So, is this another thing that you say we put into the balance if we find... Well, no, insofar as the breach of trust arises, that would be clear from the evidence with respect, whilst it may not have been... Where do we find it? Where, where do we find that the prosecution referred to this in the court below? Uh, whilst it may not have had explicit reference made to it, one need only consider the nature of the relationship <coughs> between the two of them and the act that was taking place that led to death. So there we suggest it's possible to identify the breach of trust simply from a description <coughs> of both their relationship, the fact that at the time death occurred, they were engaged in sexual activity, which was consensual. So there is a clear, we would suggest, breach of trust that arises from that, simply analysing the undisputed facts. So there was a, a relationship of trust between them? Yes. In engaging in this... Um, risky practice. Yes. Um, the reference refers to the offender being in a position of trust owing to the nature of his relationship with the deceased. Yes. So, in, in we're talking about the same thing, are we? We are, in terms of an intimate relationship between the two, but it, it, it's a wider period of position of trust in that both trust the other because of the nature of their relationship. But in the particular circumstances of what happened, she placed trust in him that he would not go further than she wanted him to do. So it's the issue of trust in relation to the sexual practice yes. concerned. Now I understand. That can be my fault for not having made it clear, and I apologise. Okay, thank you. Um, in conclusion, my lady, um, it's submitted, therefore, that the judge fell into error when he concluded that the offender's actions um, did not create a high risk of serious harm, of which he should have been aware. My submission that they did create a high risk, and that risk increased exponentially with every second that the offender continued to compress Sophie's neck after she had been rendered unconscious. And accordingly, the conclusion that this offence should be ca properly characterised as one of medium culpability is wrong. It was not such a case. Lady Sophie Moss died at the hands of a man with whom she was in a relationship, a man that she cared for and a man that she trusted would care for her. She did not consent to the infliction of any serious harm upon her and evidently she believed that the offender could be trusted not to hurt her. Had she thought otherwise, she would not have allowed him to do what he did. Despite the level of trust and affection that should have existed between the two of them, the offender strangled Sophie to the point of unconsciousness. And once she was unable to do or say anything about what was happening, he continued to apply pressure to her neck until he had killed her. The high risk of death should have been obvious to him, and it is submitted that this offence is one of high culpability. Furthermore, it's submitted that there should be an increase to the starting point to reflect the other aggravating features that have been identified. Lady, unless I can assist further, those are my submissions. Thank you very much, Madam Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Glasgow. So, Mr. Green, we have your... Respondent's notice, which has been overtaken by a skeleton argument. My lady, yes. So, um, it is conceded that the judge gave appropriate credit for guilty plea. Yes. So we needn't go there. No. 
Um, but what we do need to seek your assistance upon is the categorization yes. of culpability Idea, that yes. was involved, um, uh, the manner in which the case was presented to the court in terms of um, relationship, yes. whether or not uh, you wish to make any response to the suggestion that this was a relationship of trust and an abuse of trust. Yes. But it appears from the concession made um, on behalf of Adam Attorney General through Mr. Glasgow that the issue of the domestic violence overarching guidance will only become relevant if this court determines that the sentence was unduly lenient yes. or it was not pursued as such in the court below. My, my dear, yes. Uh, I mean, just touching very shortly, and I mean shortly because of the reason you've identified, we can largely park it for now, on the domestic abuse guideline. Um, Mr. Wright, who is my opponent, of course, below, uh, parenthetically, I would observe, is not given to missing points, uh, uh, did actively consider it, and essentially for two reasons uh, formed the view that it didn't apply. First of all, the dicta of Lord Justice Bean and Williams. And um, second, because the crime below took the view that the principal aggravating features um, which would be brought into play under that particular overarching uh, principles guideline had already been identified by the crime in any event and therefore, at best, it would be otios, and at worst, an invitation to double counting. I think Mr. Glasgow fairly hinted at that in terms of looking at oh, uh, 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 the uh, vulnerability, uh, the overlap there. Uh, 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 abso absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to make clear what the position below was, my lady. If I can turn now to culpability, uh, my submission is that the level of culpability was a matter for the overall assessment of the sentencing judge. Uh, and as has already been recognized in various ways more elegantly expressed than I'm about to put it, um, but by my lady, Lady Justice McCurr, uh, this court should be slow to uh, interfere. Uh, all the facts were uh, presented in a full and careful and measured uh, opening. And my submission in general terms is that the um, recorder of Middleborough's sentence was correct, but certainly not outside the range of reasonable sentencing options to this uh, offence. And that's plain from the sentencing remarks at page two. I don't need to invite um, my ladies and your lordship to turn it up. Uh, um, the highest moving from the general to the particular, that Madam Attorney General can put it through Mr. Glasgow, in fact, in answer to my lady, Lady Justice Carr's question about this, is that there must have been something between consciousness uh, and death. What we don't know on the evidence is whether the manual pressure to the neck continued after unconsciousness. We don't know necessarily if it even continued up to the point of unconsciousness. We don't know when unconsciousness occurred. We don't know how long there was between unconsciousness and death. We don't know whether there was any meaningful period between uh, 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 unconsciousness and death occurring, save and except to the extent that, as my lady, Lady Justice McCurr has already uh, alluded to, the uh, paramedics were uh, obviously sufficiently optimistic that there were still uh, signs of life in Sophie Moss when they attended some considerable time afterwards to make enthusiastic and concerted attempts uh, at resuscitation, tragically to no avail in the result. Uh, and uh, therefore, the uh, uh, attempt by Madam 
uh, Attorney General to uh, invite this court to catapult the case from one of medium culpability to high culpability. It depends on a premise which is entirely speculative on the face of the uh, evidence. It, 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 it you know, is. That's very, that's very clear. Can I just pick you up before you leave it? Of course. First of those don't knows. Um, you say uh, uh, we don't know if compression continued after or indeed up to um, con loss of consciousness. I understood Mr. Glasgow to be saying it must have continued. Uh, after uh, loss of consciousness. Do you accept that? Uh, um, no, I don't accept that. Uh, uh, that is um, very skillfully and forcefully put speculation okay. on behalf of the Crown. Uh, I don't make any criticism of Mr. Glasgow because um, he's an advocate, but that, whenever we strip it down, is what, with great respect, that is. Mr. Green, I mean, one of the issues that arises here um, is that the judge, the sentencing judge, in yes. circumstances such as this, must have regard to the facts and the evidence before him or her. In this case, there was evidence independent of this offender that the particular sexual practice, erotic asphyxiation, yes. was um, not unusual, Yes. certainly not unusual in the context of this offender and the deceased, yes. but in relation to other sexual partners that she um, entertained. My lady, yes. Um, now, there's no evidence that I've seen, but perhaps you can take me there, to reflect um, what previous episodes of this practice um, involve in terms of whether or not there was an agreement that a certain sign would be given to stop play. There's none. Whether or not um, in the past the asphyxiation continued to the point of lack of consciousness and then ceased. Where is the evidence about that? There's not. No, so there's no evidence, you would say, beyond speculation that this was the first time that the deceased had been strangled to the point of unconsciousness. Uh, 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 absolutely. And if that is so, then on other occasions she has recovered. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, evidently she did, yes. So, Mr. Glasgow has explained the basis of the Attorney General's case on this point, but insofar as it suggests that it is inevitable that death will follow unconsciousness, that's not evidence before the court. No, and in fact the um, contrary is uh, uh, evidence because it's a practice which she had engaged in consensually before and indeed invited uh, and that um, uh, hadn't previously had this tragic result. Well, but, but the, 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 in fairness there's no evidence that before it had gone to the point of lack of consciousness, has it? No, absolutely not. So you're, you're speculating on that as much as Mr. Glasgow was speculating the other way, perhaps. Well, uh, uh, but the, fa the fact of the matter is, there's no evidence before the court. Uh, uh, you, 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 you're, you're absolutely right. I was falling into the trap of um, uh, practicing Mr. Glasgow's alluring advocacy. Well, it's it's pretty right when you've already criticised him. But there we go. <laughs> So, so, so that's the point you made. Yeah, absolutely. And, and following on from my lady's question, um, you, you said we do not know if manual strangulation continued post-consciousness or up until the point of unconsciousness. Absolutely. Or even, um, yeah, absolutely, yes. 
We don't know. Right, and that's on the basis of lack of pathology? That's on the basis of um, there's no evidence about it. All right. Thank you. My, my lady, um, th those are my uh, submissions. Um, as belts and braces, I hope, I simply make the point that if in the result you are um, uh, against the respondent in this case to any extent, that um, you will reflect the fact that the prosecution are now adopting a different approach to that adopted in the court below and deal with double jeopardy. Uh, I raise that as belts and braces so that I don't sit down and then regret uh, not having done so once uh, I hear the court's judgment. You're referring to the domestic violence sentencing guideline, are you, with the double jeopardy? Uh, um, or because, as you know, yeah, yeah, double yes, jeopardy doesn't abs apply abs anymore. Uh, absolutely. I, I, absolutely. The way I've expressed it just perhaps over-cautiously reflects the way it's dealt with in the current edition of Archbold. In relation um, to... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, all right. M m m my ladies, my lord, um, unless I can assist further, I'll sit down. Really, is to, is to um, is to take you to that part of the the opening. Yes. Um, where the judge is considering with Mr. Wright the relevant categorisation. So this is page five. Yes. Um, Madam Attorney General um, accepted when asked specifically by my lady that um, the judge's categorization of the differential between obvious and high risk was correct. And uh, Madam Attorney General accepted the differential that the judge articulated and you obviously uh, support that uh, my, my lady absolutely uh, and it was a distinction that those defending had put the court on notice of because um, I provided the recorder of Middlesbrough with a defence note for sentencing in advance of the hearing. Which said just that. Yeah. yeah. And that's why Mr Wright goes on to say we accept that and the reason we've also postulated it being a matter for the court if this isn't a category B case it doesn't our submission fall within category C. And um, as Honour Judge Watson says as being not a category D case so therefore falling between B and D. My lady that's exactly how it was put. And that's how you submitted he should see the case? That's how I submitted that he should see the case in um, writing a day or two before the hearing. And, uh, well, this exchange had already happened. I don't think I needed to say very much about it at all in oral submissions. No, no. Thank you very much. My lady, thank you. Thank you.
Ministry of Education. Her Majesty's Solicitor General applies with Mr Glasgow, Queen's Counsel, to refer a sentence which she regards as unduly lenient pursuant to Section 36 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988. The offender, Samuel Phoebus, is 32 years old. He is a man of previous good character. He is represented before us, as he was in the court below, by Mr Green, Queen's Counsel. On the 9th of July 2021, the offender pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of Sophie Moss. Sophie Moss was 33 years old at the time of her death. She had two children who did not live with her, but with whom she was in contact, and suffered from poor physical and mental health. She was described by the judge below, and it is a description which Her Majesty's Attorney General adopts, as a vulnerable individual. Unfortunately, she had a history of alcohol abuse, depression and anxiety, and had made previous suicide attempts. The offender was known to her. He would meet the deceased about six times a year for sex and had been doing so for approximately three years. His wife knew nothing about this clandestine relationship. Despite the arrangement between the offender and the deceased, the deceased was in a relationship with another partner for about 18 months prior to her death. And he believed that other men took advantage of her vulnerability by providing her with alcohol and engaging in sexual activity with her. The sexual activity in which the deceased engaged with this offender and also with her partner involved erotic asphyxiation. As to that, the evidence before the court and that which is independent of this offender suggests that her participation in that practice was consensual and also initiated by her. It may well be that as her partner described, she was craving of male attention. On the 6th of February, 2021, the offender contacted Sophie Moss and arranged to meet with her at her address in order to have sex. He had been drinking heavily throughout the day. After his wife had gone to bed, he drove to the deceased's flat. When there, he and she continued to drink together. Shortly before five o'clock that morning, the offender walked into Darlington Police Station. He said that he had choked the deceased and that he was unsure whether she was breathing. Police officers were sent to the flat where they found Miss Moss 
naked on her bed and unresponsive. Paramedics attended and sustained efforts were made to resuscitate her. Unfortunately, despite those efforts, she died. She has left a great loss to those who loved her. The offender was interviewed. He described the nature of the sexual relationship between them. He said that the sex they shared was rough and that he used to dominate her, but that she encouraged and enjoyed erotic asphyxiation. He claimed to have no memory of what had happened on the occasion leading to her death, saying that he had come to wearing only boxer shorts and that he had found Miss Moss naked and unresponsive on the bed. He said he believed he must have strangled her but could not remember doing so and went on to say, against his own interest, that he had spent about 15 minutes in his car before deciding to drive to the police station, but otherwise had not done anything to help Miss Moss, nor had he telephoned for the emergency services that could have led to earlier attempts at her resuscitation. The first forensic examination of the uh, deceased's body um, could not ascertain the cause of death. Subsequently, the consultant forensic pathologist, Dr. Cooper, um, was able to inform the coroner that in his opinion, the cause of death was manual strangulation leading to asphyxiation. He reached the following conclusions. Whilst the cause of death was manual strangulation, there was limited evidence of any other injury beyond some minor bruising to the neck and jaw. There was no damage to the internal structures of the neck. There was no evidence of defensive injury or a prolonged assault. There was no evidence of sexual assault the injuries were at the minor end of injuries seen in cases of manual strangulation. The injuries did not suggest either very prolonged or very forceful strangulation or strangulation which was actively resisted. And the pressure to the neck would have been at least in tens of seconds, but possibly minutes, but not significant and it was impossible to accurately quantify the force or duration. Madam Attorney General, in applying for leave to refer this sentence, makes clear that she submits the error of the judge was to categorise this offender's culpability as medium rather than high. She did, however, concede that in discussion with the prosecuting counsel in the court below, that the judge correctly categorised the difference between an obvious risk and a high risk and the fact that they were not necessarily the same. Going on to say, the more obvious, clearly, then the easier it is to characterise the risk as being high. There will necessarily be some link relationship between the two but a risk which is foreseeable, even with only momentary thought, is not necessarily in itself a high risk. 
That was accepted in the court below, and it is accepted, as we indicate, by Madam Attorney General today. Nevertheless, she refers to the three features, as identified in the court below, of the vulnerability of the deceased, the alcohol consumed, and the fact of the cause of death, which suggests a manual strangulation beyond the point of loss of consciousness at a time when not only could the deceased not consent to an act of serious, which would cause serious harm, but neither would she be in a position to make any objection to the continued sexual practice in which she had commenced to embark with full knowledge of what may occur. So far as the submissions of Madam Attorney General are concerned, she concedes that the focus is on the period post-consciousness and that this court is invited to conclude on the evidence that there would have been a period, even if only of seconds, where in order for the deceased to have died at the hands of the offender, it would be necessary for him to continue to compress her neck post the period of loss of consciousness and that every second thereafter, once she had lost consciousness, the risk of death or serious harm raised exponentially. In these circumstances, she submits, the high risk of death should have been obvious to the offender and therefore this offence should have been categorised as one of high culpability. Quite apart from that, there should have been an increase in the starting point selected by the judge, which she submits should have been one of 12 years, this offence falling within category B, in order to reflect the vulnerability of the deceased, the relationship of trust which would necessarily have been in existence for the deceased to consent to the sexual practice of erotic asphyxiation, the offender's intoxication and his failure to offer any assistance to the deceased. Mr. Green, on behalf of the offender, defends the sentencing judge's categorization of this offender's culpability on the evidence that was available in this case. He submits that the Attorney General is only able to speculate as to the mechanism of death and specifically in relation to the nature 
of the asphyxiation in terms of its duration and ultimate causation of unconsciousness before death. There is no evidence in the pathological report before the court that was sufficient to base a finding that manual strangulation continued post loss of consciousness or he accepts at what point it came to an end. In these circumstances, he adopts the judge's method of categorization that if the case does not fall squarely within category B of the sentencing guideline and does not fall in category D, then it follows that it falls within category C, that being one of medium culpability and one which therefore gives the starting point adopted by the sentencing judge, further aggravated by him in acknowledgement of the features identified by Madam Attorney General. The Attorney General recognises that the relevant guideline uh, to be applied in this case is predominantly that relating to unlawful act manslaughter and that submissions made in relation to the overarching sentencing guideline in respect of domestic abuse is only to be taken into account if this court determines that the sentence is unduly lenient or as it is now conceded on her behalf by Mr Glasgow since this was not the nature of the case below then this court should bear in mind that the sentence of the court below was based upon a different prosecution case to that which now is put forward in terms of the applicability of that guideline. Turning therefore to the guideline on unlawful act manslaughter, in determining the culpability, the judge is required to have regard to the specific facts of the case and to regard the offender's conduct against the characteristics described in the different category, categories in order to reach a fair assessment of the offender's overall culpability in the context of the circumstances of the offence. The sentencing judge is advised to avoid an overly mechanistic ap application of the factors involved and described. Factors indicating higher culpability are, and this the Attorney General submits relevant to this case, that amongst other things, death was caused in the course of an unlawful act which carried a high risk of death or grievous bodily harm which was or ought to have been obvious to the offender. 
as we have previously indicated, that she focuses upon the circumstances post loss of consciousness and that which should have been obvious to the offender, not only in terms of the fact that the deceased had lost consciousness, but also had become, as Madam Attorney General with respect speculates, lifeless. Factors indicating lower culpability do not apply in this case. That was conceded realistically on the part of the offender and the sentencing judge invited to consider therefore that it necessarily was a case falling as indicated in category C between higher and lower culpability including that death had been caused in the course of an unlawful act which involved an intention by the offender to cause harm or recklessness as to whether harm would be caused that falls between high and lower culpability. As has always been conceded in this case, the fact of the deceased's consent to the practice of erotic asphyxiation was insufficient to create a defence to manslaughter and once the cause of death was ascertained then a plea of guilty to manslaughter was tendered. Assessment. Uh, we have had careful regard to the manner in which the prosecution opened this case to the sentencing judge. We consider, as did the judge below, that the prosecution had given careful consideration to the appropriate charge and had reflected that the nature of the evidence was such that it would not be possible to expect a jury to convict this offender of murder. That is, there was no evidence capable of establishing so a jury could be sure that the defendant intended to kill or to cause really serious harm. The prosecution continued to say that whilst it did not necessarily accept the narrative of events advanced by the offender, in this case the prosecution are and were unable to prove a version of events to the criminal standard that is inconsistent with that narrative. Therefore, and bearing in mind the evidence of Dr. Cooper, the pathologist, this was towards the lower end of cases involving compression. There were no other signs of violence and no motive attributable which might have pointed towards an intention. As the judge remarked, 
there was simply no other evidence and the medical evidence supported the Crown's position taken in proceeding as it did. In discussion with the sentencing judge as to the level of culpability, the prosecution made clear its case that the offender applied deliberate and sustained pressure to the neck of the deceased and that it was with sufficient force and for a sufficient time to kill, which was an obviously dangerous act and which carried with it an equally obvious risk of death or serious bodily injury. Uh, this is the case that is postulated before this court by Madam Attorney General. Following on from the discussion already referred to as to the interrelationship between an obvious risk and a high risk, the prosecution went on to say, for that reason we've postulated it being a matter for the court that if this isn't a Category B case, then it does fall within Category C. To which the judge replied, as not being a Category D case and therefore falling between B and D, and the prosecution accepting that that was so. The prosecution went on to say that there was a risk of more than minor harm and that there were aggravating factors of which we have already referred. We find on the basis of the facts in this case, on the evidence and not speculation that is advanced to account for mechanism of death, that there is no error of law which can be identified in terms of the assessment of the judge being irrational or perverse. In those circumstances, we do not accept the submissions of Madam Attorney General that the judge fell into error by considering the starting point in this case to be identified in the definitive sentencing guideline as one of six years. Dealing with the aggravating features, the judge made clear that in terms of the offender's conduct on that night, that there was aggravation in that he had taken drink to the extent that he was unable to judge the circumstances of the sexual practice in which he had engaged. That his victim was vulnerable and that he had not sought assistance for her. We pay tribute to the sentencing remarks for the measured fashion in which, whilst expressing the tragedy which had befallen a family now deprived of 
mother, daughter, sister and partner necessarily reflected the circumstances of the case before him. In his sentencing remarks, the judge paid tribute to the manner in which Sophie Moss's brother had read from a victim personal statement speaking with dignity and courage of the deep and lasting effect upon the whole family since the news of Sophie's death. Miss Moss's partner also spoke as to the effect of the death upon Miss Moss's children. The judge went on to say this, I make it clear that in dealing with you, I am punishing you for what you did in full acknowledgement that no punishment could ever truly reflect the dreadful impact on Sophie's family of her loss. No sentence could ever achieve that. With those words, we wholeheartedly agree. The judge went on to say this, it's not the function or responsibility of this court to regulate the conduct of people's private lives, save when that transgresses the law by causing harm or creating the risk of harm. You, in the course of consensual sexual activity with her, nevertheless applied compression for such a period of time, the pathologist says tens of seconds or even minutes, for long enough to lead to hypoxia, starving the brain of oxygen which led to her death. It was, in my judgment, obviously dangerous conduct, whether consensual or otherwise. Dangerous in the sense that any compression of the neck creates an obvious risk of brain damage or worse, as this case so tragically demonstrates. I cannot, however, say that the risk of death or really serious harm was so high as to justify me categorising this case in category B of the Sentencing Council's guidelines for sentencing in such cases but neither could it be said that there was minimal or no obvious risk of other than minor harm. That therefore, in my view, puts this case within category C of the Sensing Council's guideline. That provides for a starting point of six years, but as I've already observed, this was a case involving compression over a prolonged period of time, at a time when in my submission, your judgment was clouded by alcohol when otherwise you may have realised that this was dangerous so far as she was concerned and you'd gone too far. After trial, without mitigating features, the sentence I would have imposed would have been a term of eight years' imprisonment. He went on to identify the mitigation that Madam Attorney General recognises also in this case. That is, that there was no premeditation, that there was genuine remorse, and that this was a man of previous good character. He deserved and received full credit for plea made at the earliest opportunity when all relevant material was available. In those circumstances, we cannot agree that the court failed to reflect the aggravating features. We recognise that the nature of the relationship between this offender and the deceased 
was by virtue of the sexual practices in which they engaged, one that required a trust between the two. As to that, the relationship had continued spasmodically, as we have indicated, over the period of three years, to no previous notified ill effect. Bearing all the circumstances of this case in mind, we are not persuaded that the judge was wrong in categorization, was wrong in the uplift he applied in relation to the aggravating features, or was wrong in the element of discount that he gave for mitigation and then for plea of guilty. In these circumstances, we refuse permission to Madam Attorney General to refer this sentence. Thank you all very much.